Welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is April 16th, 2014, our episode 72. If you want to see all of my episodes of Walk in the Park, you can go to my vid blog, walkinpark.com. Okay, happy spring. Turns out today was kind of a wintry day, but um, we'll get back to it here. Um, I'm going to today show you a... Um, presentation given on March 30th by the Friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park, who are uh, an organization, a uh, uh, volunteer organization that helps out the state park in many different ways, particularly in education and preservation of the old mill, the park, and so forth. And every year they have an annual meeting. At their annual meeting, they have a speaker. And this year's speaker was a gentleman named Josh Teeter, who is an environmental educator with the Finger Lake State Parks, and that's actually a job I used to have for many years. And he's gonna give us a presentation on the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, which uh, operated in a number of our state parks in the Finger Lakes region during the Great Depression. This is actually a mess line of Civilian Conservation Corps young men at Robert Treeman State Park, then called Enfield Glen State Park. And uh, anyway, we'll get to that uh, pretty soon here in that presentation. But uh, the friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park, this is their website. You might want to go there. There's a lot going on. I know they have a um, I Love My Park Day going on this year in uh, May 3rd. You can sign up for that from this website and um, see what else is going on. There's old newsletters, videos, and so forth. I've had a number of their programs on this show. So um, well, let's get along here. Let's see. So. Let's get our uh, video up here for the Friends of Robert H. Stream State Park, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the Finger Lakes. Get right to that right here in a sec. employee with a wonderful presentation coming up. Josh Teeter. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. As Bob said, I work for New York State Parks and I'm lucky enough to have the job of the environmental educator. Especially in this region because we have so many parks. Um, they're, they attract millions of people, and it's my job to be out there to understand them, to know their history, to know their natural history, and then to share it with anybody who wants to listen. So apparently you guys want to hear something I want to say. So what I've done is I've prepared a presentation about the Conservation Corps, um, focusing on the Finger Lakes region and the state parks. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of background, because a lot of people have different ideas of what the Civilian Conservation Corps was. So the question, what is Civilian Conservation Corps? And the answer that I'm going to read to you is actually from a document that was put out in 1938, five years after the Corps' inception. So there was still confusion even five years later when they had to define it in a booklet that was known as the CCC, what it is and what it does. So the, the answer is that it's an independent agency created by an act of Congress in the spring of 1933 to furnish employment and vocational training for the unemployed youths who in turn assist in protecting our natural resources by carrying out nationwide conservation programs on forest, park, and farmlands. So that's a very concise definition of what they, they did. So it said spring of 1933. After FDR was elected, it took 37 days to pass this act. So it was, it was known as the Emergency Conservation Work Act. Um, and it was commonly known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. And the, the name wasn't actually changed officially to Conservation Corps until 1937. Um, so calling it the Emergency Conservation Work Act, calling the guys that were there, that would be confusing. I think the name itself, Civilian Conservation Corps, sounds a little confusing if you really think about it. So it sounds like civilians who are conserving corpse, or it could be, you could have conservation corpse of civilians, and that might make more sense. 
So I don't know if the name was confusing the whole time. Um, so these are the factors that set the stage for this emergency act. So the Great Depression, of course, was going on. There was a lot of flooding throughout the country. I mean, floods like we hadn't seen before. And the flooding was a direct cause of some poor forestry practices. I think at the time in, in 1933, I think there were about 100 million acres of forest, or 100 billion acres of forest. And three generations before, there had been 800 billion acres. So we cut and we cut and we cut really, really fast. So when it rained, the forest wasn't there to slow the water down. We also had some kind of poor farming practices at the time. We grew an overabundance of food. We were growing lots of food, where it was really hard on the soil, and the soil was starting to wash away. We had the dust bowl that was going on. We had all these guys out of work. So it set the stage. It was a perfect time for the CCC to come around. Um, in May 7th, 1933, FDR um, actually addressed the nation and describes this, this, this problem and how it's going to be good for the land, it's going to be good for the men. Um, and it was one of his most popular programs. So nationwide, they worked on structural improvement, transportation, erosion control, flood control, forest culture, forest protection, landscape and recreation, um, range and wildlife protection, and other projects. There were over 150 individual categories of projects, but this is the, this is the scaled down list. So between 1933 and 1942, this is the highlights reel of what they accomplished throughout the country. So they stocked more than 1 billion fish, planted more than 3 billion trees, established 8,192 parks, um, treated more than 21 million acres for tree diseases, um, gypsy moths, white pine blister rust, and Dutch elm disease. So they didn't stop Dutch elm disease, but they did a lot of good work. Um, they built over 9,000 small reservoirs, 4,235,000 man days of fighting forest fires, 4,622 fish rearing ponds, over 600,000 miles of roadway, over 28,000 miles of foot trails, more than 3,470 fire towers. Um, a lot of which have been taken down. There's a lot in the Catskills. You can see the bases where they used to be. There's a couple still left, so they're fun to go climb a mountain and climb on top of the fire tower that was built. Um, they spent more than 7,153,000 man days expended protecting the natural habitat to wildlife. I think that's a, a huge number. Um, and over 1,240,000 days of emergency work. Um, during flooding of the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys. So here's a map um, from 1935 that shows all the locations of all of the individual camps. Um, so in New York State, we had 208 different camps. So the way I tied this into work so I could do this at work and get paid for it was I went through the Finger Lakes Region Park Commission meeting minute notes. And what I did is there are these huge books, gigantic books, and there's actually a card catalog. There's no internet involved here. So I actually had to pull out the card catalog, go through, and any time the Civilian Conservation Course noted there's a card for it. So I went through and I pulled up every entry um, starting in 1933, ending in 1951. So this is the actual first, first entry about it. So they called it the Federal Unemployment Army Camp. So Secretary Engineer Crandall reported that the Federal Unemployment Army Relief Camp will be located near the upper entrance of Enfield Glen State Park, now renamed Robert Treeman State Park, in Tompkins County, that the minimum number of men will be 200 and this is the period for six months, but in all probability will be continued for two years. So the camp was there actually until 1941. Um, so the program went much longer than anyone had expected. Uh, 
But that's the, the nice thing about this is it frames it, it of what the actual thought was. The government was saying six months, but maybe up to two years. So they were being realistic. They knew it was going on. But um, it's $6,000 for transportation. I don't know if they were going to buy the buses. Um, I know that the engineers for the Finger Lake State Parks were being paid about $12,000 a year at that time. So that's half somebody's annual salary. So what was life like in the camp? So this is right out of another informational booklet about the CCC that they get up at 6 a.m., they eat at 6.30, they have to go make sure their barracks are clean, they're at their work site by 8. Some of the camps actually say that they had to get up, wash up, exercise, and then eat breakfast. So I don't know why you would wash up before the exercise. It seems like you would want to wash up after. Um, at 4 p.m., the eight-hour workday is over. From that time until retreat, the retreat flag ceremony, at the close of the day, the time was their own. So after supper, men are at the liberty to read or engage in other activities of their own choosing until they all have to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Side note, you know, it says no field work is done on Saturdays unless it's necessary to make up lost time. So who decides what lost time is? It's, it's a little gray. Um, So we've got the meeting minute notes, and these are this is this is a direct direct reflection of what's in these notes. And this is from December 1993, and this is from October of 1934. Did I say yeah, 33? It's um, a pretty big list, um, but they were at the park until 41. There's no other mentions directly of the projects that they worked on in the park records. So they obviously did a whole lot more work than is listed here. Um, but if we look at the list, you can see that they were busy. You had 200, 200 men. Concrete dam built for the swimming pool at their camp. Yeah, and they've got their priorities, right? First thing they do is make a swimming pool. So they graded and graveled from park entrance to their camp. They've got to get to their camp. Stone and timber bridge built near the concession building at the upper end. Um, they placed riprap in the creek bank at the upper end. Uh, just last year I saw some of that riprap float away but, um, from the storm. Concrete dam under construction at the upper end uh, to create a lake. The lake is no longer there. Um, plant nursery enlarged and planted considerable plantings at the upper end. South side of the trail from the main fall to the lower end is 95% complete. So this is in December. They got in there um, in August. So uh, has anybody been on the south side, south rim trail, they call it now? It's over two and a quarter miles long through the woods. So that's a lot of work in a short amount of time. I, I love that trail. Um, they didn't actually do the cliff stairway. Has anybody ever done the cliff staircase at Robert Treeman State Park? So I describe it to people as 222 beautiful stone steps. So on the side of a cliff. Um, it was actually built in 1927 by park workers. So part of the difficulty is the records, the park work that was done prior to the CCC coming in, and then damage that has happened over the years. So we'll get into a little bit of that. I'll show you some of that, that too. But th that makes it always tricky that the CCC gets a lot of credit for things. And, and I say that to, not to take away from the work that they did, because they probably wound up repairing a lot of that work after the storm. So some of their work is in there, I know it. Um, so Gorge Trail, considerable masonry done this summer. Still work in progress. So that's 1933. I'm going to show you a photo from 1939 where they're still working in the gorge. Um, some of the stonework there is just, it's just amazing. Um, they worked on the campsite picnic areas at the lower end. Um, they worked on a, a, a play area at the upper end, water line extended in the lower picnic area. Um, and then up here in 34, we've got three miles of trails constructed. Uh, 200 acres of woodland cleared of dead and undesirable trees. 200 acres is a lot. I mean, these guys, are they're using hand tools. They, they're not out there with chainsaws. Um, another mile of road, three camp cabins built at the lower end. Uh, they built 14 in total that are still rented out today. Um, two water supply increases, 
couple incinerators that we don't use anymore, 60 acres reforested, seed beds and nursery enlarged again, um, one large dam and two smaller dams. Um, the old mill pond site at the upper end graded in topsoil is a play area. It was a play area and then they had six campsites over there and now it's, it's a field. Um, many vistas cut to improve views and underway. Concrete fordway and footbridge at the lower end. Has anybody ever driven through that fordway? Has anybody seen the guys that really like to get the speed and create the big splash? Yeah. So the fordway is fun for a lot of people. Um, bridges, you got disposal systems, grading and planting. So let's look at some pictures here. So this, I'm going to show you a picture of this whole section right here. And if you notice, this is all a stacked wall right here. So this is all man-made from here all the way up, continuing up to this point. And this is one of the favorite lookout views for people who get into the gorge and they call it the flume area. You notice this narrow channel through here. So people spend a lot of time there. They love it there. So I'm going to show you some, some pictures of that area. And this is the lower, lower falls and this is the swimming area. So the CCC actually quarried out a lot of the rock in here and expanded this. It was a swimming area before they came, but they actually made it much, much larger. And they had to repair and build a lot of this area over here where everyone jumps off the diving board. This was the original camp. When the guys showed up, they were in tents. Um, that's what it looked like inside. Can you imagine living like that without all your stuff? Yeah, you don't have to imagine. You can remember them. Um, kind of a cool way to live, right? So they're there. By the next year, though, they, they had assembled their homes. They were, some of them were going to stay in for up to two years. So um, all of these buildings are gone. That's what the camp looked like. Some people want to, there's always debate over what the typical enrollee was, what they were like, how old they were, where they came from. Um, so in 1939 or 38, they actually surveyed 59,000 new recruits. And they found out that they were 18 and a half years old, five foot eight, 142 pounds. They had finished eight grades of public schooling. They had little um, work experience and they had five dependents at home. And on average, they made the $22 allotment home. So some people say, what were they paid? $30 a month, a dollar a day. It was right around that $30 a month. And they would send $22 to $25 home. But looks like some guys were keeping more. Um, if, if a man was, they had to be unmarried as well. If they were unmarried and had no family and they were enrolled, they didn't get to keep their $30. The government kept that extra 22 and put it in a savings account, which they got once they left. Um, so they didn't want to have anybody too flush with money at the camp. Um, so this is that area that, that I showed you the picture of. This is that flume area. So this is before 1915. You can see there's a nice wooden bridge in here. After Robert Treeman purchased the park and it became a state park in 1920, they started making improvements. So they put this cement bridge in here with an iron railing. And that was there for a while. So this is the approach where you would come in, walk down here. Remember that stacked stone wall I showed you? Right here. So that was built up to this level. So this is them working on the project. There's that stacked wall. Look what they did to the bridge. So they covered it in natural stone. Just prior to the CCC, everything like Watkins Glen was poured cement, had steel handrails, and then there was a change in thought. With the CCC, there were actually guides that encouraged them to use native stones wherever they were so that all of these works blended into the natural surroundings. They're really getting into the idea of don't make it look like man was here to get you in nature. Make, sure, make it look like it's all natural and people can get through it. So they really made the bridge look beautiful. 
So this is what it looks like today. There's that wall still there. So life is beautiful in the gorge, but it's also dangerous. So last August, this is the end of that bridge. So the flume is right underneath here. There's so much damage to it, the whole far edge had to be repaired. So what's kind of cool is you see one guy in the photo here. This is Jim Dunn. He's the park manager. He's a gray-haired guy. And then you got a brown-haired guy down here. Who's, I think Josh Grover is 25 years old. He's the park mason at the park. So he did this work. So there's, there's the edge gone. That's what it looks like when he's done with his repairs. So the mortar isn't even fully cured in this picture. So it's going to darken up and you won't be able to tell that it was done. So that's why it's difficult to interpret what work was done. So we follow their example. And luckily, we still have people like Josh Grover who are uh, good enough to do this work still. This is hard to see, but the CCC occasionally left graffiti. So Matthew left graffiti September 13th, 1939 right down in here. So this is, if you go down past Lucifer Falls, you get down on the gorge trail, before the crossover bridge, there's actually a dry stack stone wall that keeps the trail in place. So this is one of the rocks that Matthew had to put in there and then cover with dirt to, to make the trail at the bottom there. So another park that the CCC was in was Watkins Glen. We have horrible records about the projects at Watkins Glen. We know that they were there. We know that they did a lot of work. One of the things that, one of the challenges for the group that was at Watkins Glen was the day they came was July 6th is when the park um, accepted the CCC into the park. The day before, in 1935, was a horrible flood. So when they showed up, the park was in ruins. So the work that had been done there, so Watkins Glen became a state park in 1906. So improvements have been made since then, but in 1935, the flood came through. And what had happened was there was a, a railroad bridge at the top end of the park at an abutment into the stream. It was raining, 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 and all these trees fell, and they created a natural dam behind that abutment. And it just dammed up and eventually just ripped it right out, and the flow of water came through there. It was tremendous. Um, so this is in our meeting minute notes. So this is in 1936, in March. The commissioners expressed the hope that the Glen at Watkins Glen State Park be open for use by visitors during the coming season with temporary construction. And later, year by year, this will be replaced by permanent construction. So they're very realistic. They're just hoping to get it open and slowly fix it. So if you've been to Watkins Glen, this is a suspension bridge that was built in 1874. Still there. Um, same iron. I, do, I don't usually tell people that until they're out on it, that it was built in 1874. And everybody shudders a little bit. And I tell them, this, tell them we've replaced the wood a few times. But in that storm in 1935, um, they say the water was within five feet of this. So that's 75 feet of water just coming through there like a torrent. Um, you tell people when they're that up there, too, and some people get a little shaky. Not everybody likes bridges. Um, so this is the concession area down here. So it's now it's the gift shop, and there's bathrooms down here, and this is the parking lot, totally full of debris. There had been an old mill that was there that was standing that was totally washed out. So if any of you are into art, James Hope Many of his paintings that the park still had were in that building, and they were washed away. Um, again, this is still the main entrance. This is the first bridge um, going up the Gorge Trail. So they spent a lot of time cleaning up. They helped out the town of Watkins, and they started to rebuild the park. So Tony could probably know. I think this quarry was over at Montour Falls. I don't think they ever quarried at Watkins. I think they went over towards Montour and took the rocks to use there. Um, 
This is one of the recreation buildings that was on site at Watkins. We do have photos of the buildings that they lived in, but we don't have mention of, of their specific projects. So there's a barracks in the upper left, there's their mess hall in the lower right, workshop. Now we're going to go to Buttermilk Falls State Park. So Buttermilk didn't actually have a camp living on site. At Treeman, there were the 200 men. Um, and they were called State Park 16 was their camp. There was also a camp, State Park 6, that was originally stationed at Treeman. There for about six months, and then they left. But they didn't go very far. They actually went to an old Morse chain building. Well, it's old now, but it was pretty new then. It was built in 1929. It was their recreation building. So this camp did something that no other camps did. They lived inside of a building um, on South Hill. But they worked at Taganic and at Buttermilk. Um, and some of the guys from Treeman would go over here and work at Buttermilk, and they would go to Taganic as well. So at Buttermilk, the projects we have listed are stone and timber bridge, road graveling, trail work in progress, creek bank channel work, um, in 1934, we've got bridge, steps, and trail built at north end of Lake Treeman, and trail carried around the lake. Have any of you been to Lake Treeman? Okay, so it's a man-made lake. Um, I did a presentation last month, and I found out that it was named Lake Treeman. Robert Treeman was the commissioner of parks at that time. So it's kind of weird that it got named after him, right? So in the meeting minute notes, it actually says while he was out of the room, I don't know if he went to the bathroom, they voted on naming Lake Treeman after him. So he had nothing to do with it. He was out of the room. Um, so they built a storage building, four camp cabins, uh, camp shelter building, 300 yards of creek bank, stone riprap, uh, Fordway. It's so number six, remember the Fordway. So they mentioned this Fordway. Um, below the dam that's under construction. Um, road to campsite. Um, they gravel the road out to Lake Treeman. Lots of people still walk on that road. It's been paved. Um, the lower end of the spillway. Underway, small dam. It's got reservoir, grading and planting, water supply to campsites. So this is the building that they actually lived in. I don't know if the officer had some cloud in Washington and he just didn't like the barrack style or didn't want to be in a tent. Um, but they got in here. Yeah. There's a bowling alley in the basement. Most camps didn't have a bowling alley. So here's the Gorge Trail at Buttermilk. Here's the trail that they worked on. Has anybody ever seen this? There's a little shelter going up the, up the trail. This is the picture of it actually being built. People always ask, can I camp there? I say no. But um, beautiful little shelter. Nice place to have a, a picnic lunch. Okay, so that's the uh, first part of this show. His, his talk is much longer. That, again, that's Josh Teeter of the Finger Lake State Parks. Uh, March 30th, giving a presentation at actually Kendall of Ithaca for the Friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park. Um, there's our website. If you, I'm actually on the board of that organization. You can uh, go find out what's going on at the, uh, with the friends and how they're helping out the park and so forth. Next time we will have the rest of uh, Josh Teeter, environmental educator for the Finger Lake State Parks, presentation about the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Finger Lake State Parks, and uh, we'll go to Taganic and some other parks, and uh, we'll wrap up that story. There's a lot more to tell, so. Um, so thank you very much for joining me. This, if you want to see the rest of our uh, shows, uh, go to walkinpark.com, my vid blog, and I'll see you again soon.